Hello, North Carolina teachers. This is an intro to Photoshop video. My name is Michael Poller. I am the Adobe teacher at Davie County High School, and I also worked on the curriculum team for DPI this year. So in this video, we're going to go over some of the basics in Photoshop that you'll get with the worksheet that we're providing you if you're attending the summer conference intro to Photoshop session. Hopefully you have a little bit of experience with Photoshop, but if not, that's okay, because this video will walk you through the workspace, some interaction with Photoshop, and then four of probably the most basic and important parts of Photoshop. We're gonna go over layering, we're gonna go over adjusting images, we're gonna go over selecting and masking, which is essentially taking things out of pictures, and then we're gonna learn some basic text options. And I'm gonna try and break this video down into four separate sections so that we can split this up a little easier. And if you are at Summer Conference, we'll have done this live together. But if you want a refresher, that's why we're recording this video or you can take a look at it later on. So when you open the provided file at Summer Conference, you'll see something that looks like this. And you'll see that we have different pictures essentially. And these different pictures are called artboards. And artboards just allow us to edit compositions or projects within one overall file separately. And we'll go over that a little later. First off, let's look at the Photoshop workspace. The actual workspace is modular, meaning we can take different parts, so our tools or our layers or our color, and we can move them around. So you just hold left click on the word and you can drag things all over the screen. And this is really useful because once you get a little more comfortable in Photoshop, you might want to have your layers somewhere else. If you mess up your workspace, you can always go to the window menu. And the window menu allows us to pull up different panels. And we can also go to workspace, reset, and it'll reset our workspace back to whichever workspace we were using. Your default workspace is the essentials workspace. And that's just a really good workspace to use. It's got pretty much everything that an intro to Photoshop user would be using. Now, if you were painting and you only used Photoshop to paint, you might choose the painting workspace. We're not really gonna mess around with workspaces during this session, but it's really important to know that this exists, especially because you might accidentally close your layers panel, which might be the most important panel as layers, you might accidentally close it and then say, oh gosh, how do I get my layers panel back? Well, you could either reset the whole workspace or you can just go and navigate to your layers panel right here. So over on the left, we have our tools panel, just like this. Over on the right, we have our color panel. We have our properties panel that shows all the properties of whatever we're working with. And we have our layers panel. And these are really the four or three, one, two, three main panels that we're gonna be working with today. This is like our document tab right here. And you can see that we're working with the intro to Photoshop version three file. And just like in Google Chrome, you can open multiple files at the same time, have different tabs open and tab between uh, different projects. The more projects you have open, the slower your computer is gonna run. So if you're on like a school provided laptop, you probably only want to have one project open at a time. Okay, so a little bit more about our workspace. At the top, 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 we have our menus, right? Our file menu is where we're going to open files. It's where we're going to save files. It's where we're going to import pictures into our projects. It's really useful. We've got our edit menu. This is where we can do some edits. We can edit the size of pictures in here. We can edit our preferences in here. We can mess around with color profiles in here, things like that. Image allows us to adjust images, right? And we're gonna learn about this today. Layer allows us to control individual layers. Type deals with fonts. The select menu allows us to modify and edit selections. The filter is sort of this older menu that allows us to add like custom filters similar to things that you'd see in Instagram or Snapchat. The 3D does 3D work and hopefully you don't ever click on new 3D layer uh, from file, especially on your school computers because it's probably gonna freeze Photoshop. This requires a ton of computing power. 
The view menu is really important. It allows us to see our rulers, which are right here. Keyboard shortcut is control R. And it also allows us to make guides. And guides can be really useful if you wanna edit something and you only want it in a very specific place, you can make a guide. Plugins we're not gonna mess with, but you can add different custom plugins to Photoshop. And then we've got our window menu, right? And window is what we already talked about. It allows us to pull up all the different panels. Help allows us to find help. And actually for beginners, the help menu is really useful because there's a bunch of tutorials that you can access directly from Photoshop. Last I checked, those link you to the Adobe Help X pages. So it's nice to know that this is here. Also, if you're ever uh, having issues with Photoshop and the certification tests, sometimes there's issues with certain updates and you can always go to about Photoshop under help and it will show you exactly which release of Photoshop you're using. If you ever contact Certiport or Gmetrics, this is how you find exactly what version of Photoshop you're using. Lastly, when we're talking about our workspace is this docking bar right here. And this allows us to like minimize and expand panels. So let's say I'm working and I'm working with brushes and I pull up my brushes panel, right? You can see that it opens up right here and then I can minimize it with these arrows, just like that. And now I can go back to my brushes. You can have a whole bunch of different panels saved in here, and it's really useful. Uh, personally, I have my own custom workspace based on different things that I'm working on. So if I'm doing some more painting-based uh, projects, I'll have some brushes and colors and gradients. But what I like to do is more uh, photo editing and photo manipulation. So I'll have a lot of different panels in here. For example, I like to have my layers panel over here so that I can make my layers panel bigger. And you can always just drag it back and drag it around based on where you want it. And what's cool about Photoshop is let's say you always want your layers panel here and you have it set up like this. Well, then you can go to window, workspace, new workspace, and you can save this workspace. So I could call it uh, Mike's workspace, forgive my spelling, and hit save. And now this will always be there under Mike's workspace. And you'll see when you start doing uh, G metrics and Certiport that they will have custom workspaces as well that load in when you load into the test or into the practice test. All right, so that's the first part of this video, just dealing with the workspace. It was a little longer than I had planned, but that's okay. All right, we're back. This is part two of our intro to Photoshop worksheet at Summer Conference. And for this second part, we're gonna work with the layers panel. The layers panel is over on the bottom right. And again, you can move it and drag it around, but since we're probably on laptops, I'm just gonna keep it right here where the default section is. Again, you can hold left click and you can move these up and down just to give us a little bit more space. So I might expand my layers panel just a tiny bit this way. Now, before we start with the layers panel, I wanna sort of explain what we're gonna do here. We've got an example up here, which says the perfect BLT. And we just wanna make our not perfect BLT, right? Everything's all over the place look as close to the perfect one as possible. A couple of keyboard shortcuts to help you out. One is if you hold the space bar, you can pull up the hand tool. So while holding space bar, if you hold left click, you can move your screen around. This isn't actually moving any of the objects on screen. All it's doing is it's moving what we're looking at. Essentially, we're a camera looking top down at our screen. And so the hand tool allows us to sort of pan around the workspace. The keyboard shortcut for that tool is H and it's right here, the hand tool. The other thing I wanna go over is the toolbar. Now the toolbar or the tools, there's a lot of tools and you can right click on each tool and it pulls up like sub tools within that larger tool group. And these little dots here allow us to edit our toolbar as well, but we're not gonna worry about that. The main tool that we're gonna be using today, especially on this first artboard, is this first tool right here called the move tool. This is the tool that you need to be on if you wanna move objects on screen. The keyboard shortcut is V. It is one of probably the five most useful keyboard shortcuts, along with 
control S to save would probably be V and control S I would say, and spacebar to move are the three shortcuts that I use more than anything else. Okay. So let's start working. Now, if we want to zoom in and zoom out on our screen, we can go to the magnifying glass and we can click to zoom in and alt click to zoom out or control and plus and minus on your keyboard will zoom in and zoom out. If you have a regular mouse, not a trackpad, holding alt and scrolling up and down will zoom in and zoom out as well. Okay, so let's talk about this panel right here called the layers panel. In Photoshop, every image, every text, every object, every painting can be separated out into a separate layer. And when we separate things out into different layers, we have individual control over that layer. If my whole sandwich was on one layer, I could only move the whole sandwich at one time. If this whole picture was one layer, which I believe I made it, I did, right? I can only move this whole layer. I can no longer move the text. I can't move the plate. I can't move the sandwich or anything like that. So having separate layers is really useful, right? It's very useful. Every time we put a picture into Photoshop, like let's say I'm working on a project and I have 10 pictures in that project, each picture automatically goes in as a separate layer by default. So our layers panel is over on the right, and there's a lot of options in the layers panel. It can be a little daunting at first, but hopefully this will get us through some of the scariness of that. Right now, each one of these larger capitalized layers are technically artboards. And within each artboard, if I click on the little arrow next to it, I see my layers. So just to make it easier, right? We can turn off all of the artboards that we're not using. So I'm going to click on the little eye and you'll see that it starts to hide these artboards because we only need these two right here. And this artboard, the example one is locked because we don't want to work with that. If we want to lock something, we select it and we click on the little lock icon right here. It's really useful to lock layers if we don't accidentally want to delete them or paint on them or something like that. So I'm going to zoom in here a little bit. And what we're going to do is we're going to expand this layers and layer styles artboard. And you'll see there's a bunch of layers. There's a table layer. We can turn things on and off by clicking on the eye. There's a plate layer. There's a bread layer, a lettuce layer, tomato layer, bacon one, bacon two. And then we've got some different text on different layers. I split them out onto different layers so that we can edit them separately. In our layers panel, you'll see that each layer has a name. We can double click on the name to rename it. So sometimes like when you download a picture, it's just called image one, two, three, four, five. But let's say that's a picture of uh, bacon. I would wanna rename that bacon just so I know exactly what it is. We can again lock layers by clicking on the lock icon. We can select multiple layers by holding control and selecting multiple layers. And next to each layer, there's a little thumbnail, just like this. And that thumbnail shows us exactly what the layer is. So this plate is a plate and I can see that. The table layer looks like a table texture. If we could zoom in really far, the lettuce would be this piece of lettuce, et cetera, et cetera. Text layers act differently because it's text and I can always re-edit that text. And so we see that little T right here, that lets me know that it's a text layer. So let's say right now, I don't wanna work on the text layers. I wanna leave them where they are. I'm gonna go ahead and lock each text layer. And I think I might actually hide them just to make this a little easier. So our goal here is to use the different layers to create a sandwich, just like this. Now here's the secret with the layers panel. It's not really a secret, it's just how it works. The order of your layers going from the bottom to the top is the order that you see things on on the screen. So this table layer is at the bottom and everything is underneath it, right? If I hold left click on the layer here and drag it to the top, 
notice that it's now covering all of my layers, right? Everything is still there. It's just hidden because my table layer is above it. So we wanna get used to using the layers panel to order things. The term for that is called the stacking order, right? This is our layer stack. And whatever's on top in the layer stack is on top on the document. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna hide everything except the plate. And let's say I wanna move the plate around, right? As long as I have the move tool, if I just hold left click on an object, I can move it. And if I left click on the table, you'll see that it moves the table. So Photoshop knows what we wanna select. And that's actually up here. It says auto select. If we turn that off, then it won't select whatever we click on. It'll only select what layer is selected. Generally, like we wanna leave this on because it makes working with Photoshop a lot easier. If you have a lot of really, really tiny things, then you can accidentally click on the wrong object. So we're gonna move this plate. Now let's say I wanna make my plate a little bigger or a little smaller. We need to transform it. And there's really two ways that we can transform. There's actually like in Photoshop, a lot of ways to do anything. But I'm gonna just try and do the most basic thing. A tool or a function is called free transform. And that allows me to like scale and skew and distort and also rotate objects. There's two ways to get to that. One is with your layer selected, control T on your keyboard brings up the free transform panel or window or tool, I guess. And we know that we're in free transform because of this bounding box right here. And with this now I can grab the corner and I can make it bigger or smaller. I can rotate it by hovering around the corner and spinning. Of course, this is a round plate. So rotating, it's not really gonna make it look any different other than the little shadows and highlights. And then when we're finished, we either hit enter on our keyboard or we click the little check at the top. If you don't click the check, you can't really do other stuff. The other way to get there is under edit, free transform. And you'll see next to free transform that it says control T because that's the keyboard shortcut. So I'm in here, control T, I might make it a little smaller, just like this. And now I hit enter. And let's say I'm finished with this plate. I like where it is. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna lock it. Boom, it's locked. And I'm gonna turn my bread layer on. And I'm gonna mess with this bread layer. Now, just looking at this, maybe my plate is a little smaller than the sample plate. We're not going for a one-to-one -one recreation. We just wanna sort of experiment, but get it close. So maybe I'll actually go back to my plate layer, unlock it by clicking on the little lock icon and make it a little bigger. There we go and I'll hit enter, and now I'm gonna lock it again. Now my piece of bread, it's probably a little too big for the plate, and maybe I wanna get fancy, I wanna rotate it a little bit. So I'm gonna select my bread, I'm gonna do control T, I'm gonna scale it down a little bit, and I'm just gonna rotate it some, maybe just like that. I'm gonna hit enter, and I'm happy with that, and I'm gonna lock it. And I'm gonna turn my lettuce on, and maybe I'm gonna rotate my lettuce, control T, rotate it some like this, maybe scale it down a little, just like that. And I'm happy with that. And I'm gonna lock it. And so what we wanna do is we wanna do that to each of the food layers. So I'll turn my tomato on, just like this. I'll put it here and I'm happy and I'll lock it. And now we have an issue. I might want more tomatoes. So how do I duplicate layers? It's actually really easy. Control J with your layer selected is the keyboard shortcut to duplicate. You'll see it duplicated my tomato and I can move it. Control Z is the keyboard shortcut to go back. Also probably one of the most important keyboard shortcuts. The other thing you can do is right click on your layer and choose duplicate layer. It's the same thing. So maybe I'll make three tomatoes, just like that. Now it's gonna bring us to something else. I know we're flying here, we're moving fast, but that's okay. Tomatoes are like a little transparent, right? They're a little translucent, we can see through them some. Right now, I can't see through these tomatoes at all. In Photoshop, in our layers panel, there's this word that says opacity. Opacity is how see-through something is. If I wanna make this tomato more see-through, 
I can just click this little drop down and drag this to the left. And you'll see if I put it at zero, it's totally hidden. If I put it at 50, it's 50% 50 transparent. That's not what a tomato looks like, right? That looks ridiculous. At 100, it is not transparent at all, right? So maybe I'll put it at like 90%, 86. I'm happy with that. And you can actually see, like if I move this off to the side, see how we like see that wood line behind it? So it's sort of transparent, just like a tomato would be. So I'm going to 86. I'm going to go to this one. We can actually just click on the number and type in 86. And I'll go to this one, 86. It's ironic because we're not actually 86ing anything in a restaurant. We're not canceling it. Um, didn't think about that until just now. And I'm happy with these tomatoes. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to lock them. Now, locking things is really up to you. I like to teach my students to lock stuff because especially in the beginning, it means they won't accidentally mess it up later on. I'm going to do the same thing with the bacon. I'm going to turn these bacon strips on. I'm going to move them around. I might do control T, make them a little smaller, maybe rotate it like this. Enter, take this one, control T, so rotate it. And I might like want to have more bacon on there. Personally, I like bacon despite being Jewish. So I'm going to do control J. And I've got another strip of bacon. I might control T, rotate it a little bit, just like that. I've got three strips. Is that enough bacon? I don't know. Maybe four strips of bacon. So I'll duplicate it again with control J. I've got my bacon on there. And now I've got my BLT, right? I've got bacon, lettuce, tomato, and one slice of bread. But we're not trying to make an open face BLT, right? That's not a real thing. We want to do a closed face. We want that other slice of bread. But I only gave you one piece of bread. So can anyone guess how you would get another slice of bread on top with what we have? I'm playing the Jeopardy music in my head while you think. Okay, hopefully you thought of it. And what you're going to do is you're just going to select your bread layer, maybe unlock it, and we're going to duplicate it, right? Duplicate it, control J. And then we want to drag it, right? We're going to use that stacking order. We're going to drag it up to the top. Boom. And maybe I'll move it off to the side a little. Show off that bacon a little bit. Uh, maybe like this way. I don't know. However you want to do it, right? I like it like this, I think. And so now we've got a sandwich. And this is really basic stuff in the layers panel, right? There's a lot more we can do. We can group layers. We can delete layers. We can merge layers. We can convert and rasterize layers. But we're not really going to worry about that. We just want to get used to hiding layers, moving layers, locking layers, and duplicating layers. And maybe I'll turn the perfect BLT on now. And if we go up to the top, the perfect is actually underneath the plate. So I'm going to grab the word, the perfect, and I'm just going to drag it down, right? And then I'll drag it down a little more. And now you can see it goes from above the plate to below the plate. And BLT is on top because we're doing something a little fancy, right? We're creating depth. Um, now here's the thing. This looks really flat overall. It looks like I literally just copy and pasted pictures on top of other pictures. And if we look at our sample, there's something there that isn't on the one that we made. And you've probably guessed it, it's shadows, right? There's multiple ways you can create shadows in Photoshop. And if you're doing some really advanced compositing, you're probably drawing your own shadows on by hand because that gives you the most control. But we're going to keep it real basic and we're going to use Photoshop and we're going to create drop shadows. Now, drop shadows are a type of layer style. And we can stylize layers with drop shadows, bevel and emboss, strokes, glows, color overlays. There's a whole lot of different options in there. They're really easy to do. And this is how we're going to do it. I'm going to go in. I'm going to take my plate layer and I need to unlock it. And in the bottom of our layers panel, there's a little icon that says FX. And if you hover over it, we get what's called a tool tip. And that says add a layer style. You can also go to layer and do layer style up here. They are the same exact functions. I like to stay in my layers panel because I don't have to move my mouse as much. And it is uh, over time, it will save you a lot of time. 
So I'm going to click on this and I'm just going to click on the word drop shadow right here. And that brings up my layer style dialog box, right? And actually we see the plate and you can see already that there's like a little bit of a shadow. It's a little hard to see, but it's there. I can click this to turn it on and off. Do you see the difference? It's very minimal right now. There's a bunch of options in here. We don't even really want to worry about all these options. The only ones we want to worry about are opacity. That's how see-through the shadow is, right? Because shadows are sort of see-through. And color. I could choose color, right? So if I had like uh, different color lights or whatever, I could change my shadow color. So let's say I put it opacity at like 80%. Now here's what's cool is you can actually just with this box open, hold left click on your page, on your document, and you can start to move this over just like that, right? I've got a little shadow. Maybe I think it's too dark, so I'll lower my opacity some. And we can play around with these functions too. You'll see that they all do different things. You can feel free to play around with them, right? They're going to just change the way our shadow looks, right? How far away from the table is my plate? If it was like this, the plate would be hovering way over the table. That doesn't really make a lot of sense. So I might move this back over here just like that. Play around with this some. Right now I've got a little drop shadow. And I'm happy with that. And I'm going to hit OK. And the light is coming, if the shadow is like this, right, the light would be coming up and from the right a little bit, which makes sense because the highlight is up here and the shadow is down here. Actually, it would probably be reversed because of the way the light would hit. I'm not going to worry about that. You could go ahead and you can click on FX drop shadow on each object here. But it's not always the best thing to do. Sometimes we can copy and paste our layer styles. So I'm going to unlock all these layers. And I'm going to right click on the plate layer, just like this. And I'm going to choose copy layer style. And now I can go in anything that I want to give a drop shadow to, I can paste that layer style on. So I'm going to paste it on, let's say the lettuce, not necessarily everything. Paste layer style on the lettuce. And you can see there's a little drop shadow, maybe on these slices of bacon here, I'll go in paste layer style, right? Right click paste layer style right click paste layer style. You can do as much of this as you want. And you can see I'm getting a little more dynamic, right? There's a little bit of depth in there. Now I might take this top piece of bread, right click paste layer style. Mm, there's a problem here that is my fault actually. So I might turn off this layer style just like this. Cause I don't like the way it looks, but I am going to put it on the text, right? Right click paste layer style and go down, right click paste layer style. And does it look exactly the same? It does not look exactly the same, but it's pretty close. And this has really taught us a lot about the layers panel. So this doing stuff like this, layering, moving layers, adjusting the stacking order, hiding, revealing layers, renaming layers, duplicating layers, adding layer styles is a, is really a lot of Photoshop right there, right? If you can do this, pretty successfully. And if you feel comfortable with this, you've really advanced in Photoshop. And maybe when we're done, I'll lock this whole artboard now. All right, that's it for this second part of the video. Moving on next, we're going to start talking about image adjustments. It's way easier than layers. All right, we'll be right back. And we're back. It's part three, image adjustments. We've got this image adjustments artboard, which we hid last time. So I'm going to click on the little blank eye next to it. I'm going to turn it on and I might turn off my other artboards. Little keyboard shortcut is if you hold alt and click on the artboard, it pulls up that artboard full screen, just like this. Now image adjustments allow us to like change brightness, change color, change contrast. And there's some special adjustments that we can do as well. There's really two ways to do image adjustments. There's adjustment layers and just default image adjustments. In, uh, adjustment layers adjust all the layers beneath them in the stack. So they're really useful for some things, but they can really mess up your project if you're not paying attention. Image adjustments by themselves just adjust the one image that they're applied to. So that's what we're going to work with for this artboard. If we open this artboard up, You'll see that there are one, two, three, four different pictures. 
And each one is called something. So we got black and white, we have hue saturation, we have levels, and we have brightness contrast. I'm gonna turn all of them off except for brightness contrast. And here we have a picture. Now, personally, I like this picture. I wouldn't necessarily adjust this image, but for the sake of learning, this is a sort of low contrast image. The brights aren't all that bright and the darks aren't super dark, although her shirt and camera are really dark right here. Contrast in Photoshop and in photography is the separation between the brightest parts of our image and the darkest parts of our image. So a really flat image is going to not have a lot of separation. It's not contrasty. And an image with a lot of contrast is going to be really bright and really dark. And you might be like, well, why not just bump the contrast up all the time, right? Because it makes it look more interesting, maybe. And the reason for that is because when we bump up the contrast, we lose a lot of the middle, right? All the sort of nice colors, those midtones get uh, erased. And the brighter we make an image and the darker we make an image, the highlight details and the shadow details tend to get lost. So we're going to work with this first layer right here. Now, you'll see each of these layers has a little tiny icon right here. And that icon, if you hover over it, says that it's a smart object. And what that means is that if we make certain changes to our picture, such as an image adjustment, we can turn that adjustment on and off and we can re-edit that adjustment later on. So how do we add image adjustments? It's really simple. Really what's difficult about this is getting things to look better, right? Doing it is easy. Doing it right is what takes practice and different photographers and different designers have their own styles. And it just takes time to sort of develop your taste and your style. So we're going to select the layer in the layers panel, and we're going to go up to our image menu, right? This is where we adjust images. I can adjust the size of an image. I can adjust the rotation of our image, but we're going to do these adjustments right here. And you'll see that there are sort of different sections of adjustments. These first four are all brightness and contrast. The next like one, two, three, seven are color. And then down here, I would call them like sort of our more special adjustments. So for example, like invert swaps all the colors, right? It's like the opposite of its color. I'm gonna, and you'll see in the layers panel that it says invert, right? And I could turn that on and off. I'm just gonna control Z and undo that though, because I don't want that. We're gonna work on this one with brightness contrast. Now, I'm gonna say something here. And that is that personally, I don't like to use brightness contrast because it doesn't give us a lot of control over our image, right? I can make my image brighter or darker by toggling this slider. And you'll see, right? When I make it brighter, these sort of things in the top left, these branches get lost. And I'm going to type zero back in there and I could lower the contrast, right? Which is going to give me a flatter image. It doesn't really change a lot because the image is already flat and I could bump the contrast up a lot. But you see, right, when I bump the contrast up all the way, like the wrinkles in her pants go away, the details in her shirt go away, to the point where I can't really tell where her arm here begins and ends based on her pants and her body, right? And these people sort of become like a merge into one person. So we can control these basically with these sliders. So maybe I'll increase the brightness a little bit and maybe I'll bump up the contrast just a tiny bit, or I could lower the contrast, right? It's sort of up to you. And then we hit okay. And I can see my original and my adjustment by toggling the little eye under smart filters. And what's cool about this is you can actually like add multiple adjustments to one image. And we'll do that when we go up to hue saturation here. All right, so that's brightness contrast. Let's turn on levels and we're gonna select the levels layer. Now adjusting the levels allows us to adjust the contrast, but it gives us way more control. I try to tell my students to use levels over brightness contrast all the time. In reality, when we get better, I have them use what's called a curves adjustment, but for now levels is going to be fine. So we're going to select the levels layer. We're going to navigate to image adjustments 
levels and we're going to click on levels and that brings up our levels adjustments and there's a lot that we can do in here we're not going to worry about channel but i can affect only the red channels only the green only the blue there's presets in here so if i just want to increase contrast a little i could choose that these output levels down here are like how bright and how dark the overall image is so if i just wanted to brighten my image up a little i could just slide this just like that right if i think that too much detail is lost in the shadows what we really want to work with are these three little sliders right here and each of those adjusts a different part of the image the darkest one on the left is our shadow detail shadow isn't necessarily shadows it's just the darkest parts of the image the slider all the way on the right is our highlights right it's the brightest part of an image and the one in the middle that's gray is our midtones. So if I'm looking at this picture and I'm thinking I want to make it maybe a little more interesting, right? I want to add some more contrast and I want to look at like what is the darkest and what's the brightest part of our image. So the highlights of the picture, the brightest parts is really like the thing that's closest to pure white. And I would say that that's the table is a highlight. Her teeth are highlights. The rims of her glasses are highlights and the highlights literally on her cheek and nose are highlights. And what are the shadows, right? The shadows are literally the darkest parts of the image. So what are shadows here? Her hair down here are shadows. Her pupils are shadows. The inside of her mouth is a shadow and probably like under the laptop here is a shadow. Everything else is the midtones. So if I take this hi uh, highlight and drag it in, you'll see that it boosts the highlights, right? It makes every bright part brighter, but it does not make the dark parts darker because I'm not just increasing the contrast, I'm only increasing the highlights. And now I could take the midtones and drag them this way to make those midtones darker. And now I could take my shadows and I could make them darker, right? And we can really like destroy an image by creating like ultimate contrast. So now I've got really dark, pure black, really white, pure white, and everything in the middle is gone, right? We don't usually wanna do that unless you wanna make something look like deep fried is the term. So maybe I'll just boost my, in fact, maybe I won't boost the highlights at all. Maybe I think it's too bright. So I'll just take the midtones and I'll drag them down a little bit to create a darker image. Again, I feel like I've lost detail in here, but we're really just learning the tool. And I'm going to finish, so I'm going to hit OK. And I can see, right, original, new, original, new. Not a lot of change, right? We brought out the color in her skin a little more. We darkened her hair and her shirt a little bit. And we removed some of those bright highlights from her face, right? This is really bright. Maybe it looks a little washed out. And so we just brought a little color back in by moving those midtones. All right, let's go over to hue saturation. So we can adjust the brightness and we can also adjust colors. And I'm going to go to image adjustments, hue saturation. Now, hue is the color. Saturation is how colorful it is. So you'll just see, right, as I play around with this slider under hue, it sort of pushes all of the colors. So I can make these rocks blue and then I can increase the saturation all the way. This looks terrible, right? If your student was trying to make a picture look better and submitted a picture like this, they did something wrong. Uh, but if they're just having fun, you know, they're having fun. If we take the saturation all the way out, we get a black and white or grayscale image. So you might be like, well, why would you ever use this, right? Why would you ever shift the hue? Well, eventually you'll learn how to like select different parts of an image. So I could just change the hue of the ocean right? If I just wanted to make the ocean a little more blue, I could do that. So this allows us to do this, right? Hue saturation. So let's say I just increase the saturation a little bit and I just move the hue a little bit to the right, right? I get hue saturation, but what if I want to also do a levels adjustment, right? I can go back and do image adjustments levels, and now I can adjust the levels of this image too. Right, so now I've got a bunch of change, right? I really sort of made this pop, although it's not natural looking, right? The rocks don't look like this. 
by just adding different filters or not filters, sorry, different adjustments. Lastly, black and white, right? We can select this layer, turn it on. And this is a graveyard. I don't know if it's a military graveyard or not, but right, funerals are sad. And maybe we want to make this image more sad by making it black and white. So I can go to image adjustments and just choose black and white right here. And it makes my picture black and white and I can hit okay. Those are image adjustments, right? You just need to use them on your own and get used to using them to try and develop a style for yourself. Eventually you'll be adding a ton of different adjustments to one picture just to get it to look exactly the way you want it to. That was part three. We'll be back. And we're back. It is part four. I had a little bit of water and a snack. Hopefully I'm a little more energetic here because I was getting hungry and my throat hopefully also isn't quite as scratchy. So let's go ahead. We're going to move over, right? We're going to turn on our selecting and masking artboards and let's hide our image adjustment artboard. And we're going to look at these two right here. And we have our example and we have the one that we're going to work with. And you'll notice the difference is that the shape in the house don't have the white background. And so what we're going to learn how to do is the most basic form of removing backgrounds from images. So eventually you could replace this shape or this house with a person and you could replace the white background with a location, right? And then you could layer in other locations. Now there's two ways, or there's really a lot of ways to remove backgrounds, but we want to think of them as either destructive or non-destructive. Destructive editing is where we permanently delete the background. Cropping an image is destructive. Erasing, using the eraser tool, is destructive. We want to do things non-destructively. It gives us far more control. Having said that, there's nothing wrong inherently with destructive editing. Sometimes we want to crop an image, we crop it. Sometimes we want to erase a stray hair, we erase a stray hair. But trying to erase around this white border is a nightmare, right? Just as an example, if I select my orange square layer and I get my eraser tool and try and just erase this white, right? What you're going to start to see is that I actually can't do it. Um, right, I erase some of the square by accident. The eraser is a circle, but the square is rectangular. So it's giving us all sorts of problems, right? We don't want to do that. It's inefficient. It takes too long and it's not accurate. So we want to learn how to do what's called masking. And masking is where we select an object in a picture and we tell Photoshop, get rid of everything else. And it's really powerful. You can edit your masks. You can bring things back. You can fix them. You can feather them. You can change the opacity of your mask. It's one of the core functions of Photoshop. Masking also exists in Premiere Pro. It exists in After Effects. It even exists in some form or another in Adobe Illustrator, right? Masking is just sort of a crucial part of graphic design and really all design work. So let's start with this orange square. We're going to go ahead and we're going to select the square layer in our layers panel. We always need to have the layer selected that we want to work on before we start working on it. Now there's a lot of different ways that Photoshop can select things. Sometimes it just does it for us, but before we learn how to make it do it for us, we should learn basically how to do it ourselves. And if we just have a shape like this, right, we can use this tool right here called the marquee tool. The marquee selects a shape, rectangles, squares, ellipses, circles, and then single row of pixels, single column of pixels. We're not going to worry about single row and single column. And for the ease of trying to do this on a laptop, we're not going to worry about the elliptical marquee. We're just going to use the rectangular marquee. So we're going to go ahead and select it. And with this tool, we just hold left click and we drag. And we select what we want to select. Now, let's say you accidentally went like this and you selected too much. If you want to start over, you can either control Z to go back a step, but it's probably good to know that with your selection tool, you can right click and choose deselect 
or, <clears throat> excuse me, control D on your keyboard deselects. So we want to try and get as close as possible. And I'm actually like off by a couple of rows of pixels. So I might do that again. I might zoom in some, control D, hover over the corner, right? It's really hard to get exactly on, especially because like it sort of fades out at the end there. So I'm not going to worry, right? We're not going to worry about getting it perfect. In fact, I might go inside the boundaries a little, but I have this like this. Now, these dancing ants, as I like to call them, means that we have something selected. In Photoshop, if you have something selected, you can only work inside the boundaries of that selection. For example, let's say I got my paintbrush and I wanted to paint on my page. When I paint, I can only paint right inside the selection. See how that's not going outside the selection? So it's really useful, right? If I knew that I wanted to paint only on like a little part of an image, we would select that part of the image before we start painting. So let's say we have this selected just like this, right? And we have our selection tool. We can hold left click. We can move the selection around, but we're ready, right? We're ready to get rid of this. Whoops. White background, right? We want to create a mask. The easiest way to create a mask. We're just going to do the most basic way is to click on next to our layer styles. If you hover over your tool tip, will say add layer mask. It's a little white rectangle with a black square. And I click on that and voila, the background is gone, right? Photoshop hid the background. If we look in our layers panel, we now see our thumbnail and we see something linked next to it. And what's linked is literally our mask. What's black is what's hidden and what's white is what's revealed. So we can see, right, that the black is gone and the white is our rectangle. If I hold alt and click on that, it'll show me like a black and white version and you can see, right, everything's gone except our orange rectangle. What's nice about masks is because it's non-destructive, I can right click on it, I could disable it, I could delete it. And I could edit it if I wanted to, but that is a little more advanced and we're not going to worry about that for now. Let's move down to this house, right? We're going to grab our house layer. Now, how would I select a house with only rectangles? I could, right, hold shift and keep adding to my selection, but this would take forever and it would be really inaccurate. Even though every pixel is technically a square, I don't want to have to select squares like this. It's literally the opposite of what we should be doing in Photoshop. Instead, we're going to use a tool called the polygonal or polygonal lasso tool. And it's right beneath our marquee tool are the lasso tools. The lasso tools allow us to sort of free form or trace the outline of our object. The basic lasso, you have to hold left click and draw magnetic snaps based on color information. And polygonal just allows us to click on the corners. So we're going to grab the polygonal lasso tool, make sure our house layer is selected, and I'm going to click every time the line changes direction. So I'm going to like left click here and I'm not holding left click. I'm just moving my mouse, click, 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 click. And now I want to connect the dots. And you'll see I've got my dancing ants. It's not perfect. That's okay. And then I add the mask. And I didn't do a great job, right? I messed up on the roof compared to this one. But we got rid of the background. If I wanted to do it again, I could right click, delete the layer mask. And this time maybe I'll zoom in some. And I'm using spacebar to move around. Connect the dots, add the mask. There we go. All right, that looks a lot more like the first one. Okay, that's really basic selecting and masking. We'll be back with a little more advanced masking after this break from our sponsors. We're back again. I was not able to get any sponsors. No one wanted to sponsor my channel. 
So I guess I am just going to move on. And let's go ahead and let's hide the selecting and masking. And we're going to turn on select subject. We're going to move over here. And we're just going to do similar but a little more advanced version of what we did. And we're going to try and create what I like to call or what people would call, right, like an image composite or photo manipulation. If we open up our select subject layer or artboard, sorry, you'll see that we have three pictures. We've got this person standing on a rock in the mountains. We've got this picture of land and we've got a nice sky. And what if I want to combine all of those to get something like this, right? That's what we're going to learn. So let's turn off this person layer. First, right, I'm looking and I'm thinking like, all right, I like this sky, but I like this land more, right? It wouldn't make sense if the person was standing on the water. So how do I get this land out from the sky? Well, we learned it last time. I'm going to select my land layer and I'm going to grab my rectangular marquee. I'm not worried about getting all of these trees. I'm not worried about the tree line. I just want the land. So I'm just going to hold left click and I'm going to select some of the land just like that. It's not perfect. It's okay. It doesn't really matter if it's not perfect, right? This is practice and no one would know anyway because it's not real. And I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to add my mask, right? Just like this. And now I've got my land and my sky. But if you did it like I did, you have a little bit of an issue, right? And that is that my sky my horizon, right, in my land picture doesn't perfectly match up with the horizon line in my sky picture. So there's a few things we could do. I could select my sky picture and I could just move it down some, right? I've got all this extra space. It shouldn't be like this. We still want the sort of the clouds above, maybe like that. Nope, that's not good either. Just like that. Nope, still got a little bit of problem there. So I might move it down some more. I can also, if I want it like this, right, select my land layer. Control T, and I can stretch it just like this. Right, I can make it a little bigger, just like that. And I'm going to hit enter. And now I've got a little bit of photo manipulation. I'm trying to create something from nothing, essentially, or from things that are real, but we're going to make something that's not real. So I've got my sky, I've got my land. And my land actually isn't quite big enough at the bottom. I can see that. So I'll scale it down a little more like that. There we go. And now I'm going to turn my person on. And now I got to get this guy out of the rock. I can't use the rectangular marquee. I could try and use the freeform lasso tool, but you'd have to have some kind of special tracing ability that I do not know if it exists right, to try and trace this guy out. And it's especially problematic because there's some space in between his legs that I can't really get with the lasso tool, right? And if I added that mask, oh, that looks terrible. So instead, we're going to start to harness the magic of Photoshop. And in the beginning of our session, we talked about pixels and colors and Essentially, like Photoshop knows where one color begins and one color ends. And it's able to like look at images and analyze the subject of the picture, whether that's a person, whether that's a hamburger or a BLT, I should say, or whether it's a dog or whatever, right? Photoshop sort of knows or guesses. It thinks it knows what the subject is. Now, Photoshop is not perfect. Doing things by hand always is going to give us a more accurate version of what we want. But if we want to do things quickly, we let Photoshop do it for us. So we're going to select our person layer right here. And instead of the lasso tool, we're going to move down here to the object selection tool. And this is where Photoshop selects things for us. There's three tools, object select, quick select, magic wand, we're not really going to use any of these tools, although they all do different things. Magic wand selects one color, object select selects an object, you drag a box over it, and quick select allows us to essentially paint uh, on our selection and it snaps to the boundaries of where colors are. We're just going to select the object select tool and we want to make sure our layer is selected. 
And I always tell my students, right? Because we're, we're definitely time limited. We don't always have time to sit there and have them like mask things out by hand. You can actually see, right? With the object select tool, if I hover over this guy, it like highlights in blue and it actually does not select in between his legs. It actually looks like it misses a little bit of his ear and you can see, right? It has trouble telling the difference between the sky and part of his hand, but it's pretty accurate, right? If I select it, it selects him. It's really close. So you could either do that, but I'm going to show you another thing. And this is what I always tell my students to start with, right? Just for the sake of time. It's not really like the most professional way to do something, but there's this select subject option at the top and it is going to select him for us. And you can see it is like pretty darn accurate. It missed a little bit down here. It works based off of colors, right? And we know that colors are, or pixels are squares of color. And so it got a little bit of the ground because his shoe is the same color as the shadow, right? And it's not perfect, right? We lost some pixels there. We lost a little bit there, but it's pretty close. The hand is good. The hair is good. So now that we have him selected, we're going to click on the mask and boom, right? Look at that background is gone. Now I can go back to my move tool and I can move him down, right? Maybe he's standing like this, like he's off screen a little bit. And there we go. Now I want to show you something. This looks a little different here. I adjusted the colors a little bit at the top. So far we know we can do image adjustments and adjust colors that way. But, but what if we want to adjust all three of these pictures at the same time? Well, that's where we're going to use what's called adjustment layers. And we're going to go to layer up at the top and we're going to choose new adjustment layer. And that's going to create a layer in our layers panel that will adjust everything beneath it. So I could play with any of these, right? I could do brightness contrast. So I'll just show you as an example, right? It creates that layer. And then in my properties panel over here, if I lower the brightness, see how it makes everything darker or everything brighter? Pretty useful, pretty cool, right? Maybe I'll lower the brightness and increase the contrast a little. Maybe I'll do another adjustment layer. And this time I'll choose, let's say photo filter. I'm just playing around my properties panel, right? I can choose a preset. Let's choose, I don't know, cooling filter. Oh uh, no, let's do sepia. And I can adjust the density of that filter. Right now I've got these adjustment layers and I've got my little image composite there. So in about five minutes, I got rid of the sky. I got this person out of the background and I tried to adjust the colors of all of the pictures together to create something that looks a little more like it belongs together compared to if I just had all these pictures separately, well, like the land is a different color than the sky, which is a different brightness than the guy and the shadows in this picture are coming from this side and on the guy they're on the right side. So it's not perfect. But if we add some adjustment layers on there, it really ties the image together a little bit more. So that is a little more advanced in terms of masking, but it's still pretty easy to do. Uh, next, we're going to learn text and that'll be the end of our video. I'll be right back. We're back and we're close to the end. You guys are all crushing this, hopefully. And this is a lot in one day um, and in one video, right? The first day that I teach Photoshop with my students, we just learn how to import images and how to change the size and the stacking order. So the fact that we're doing all this real fast is very impressive. And again, this is a crash course on what I think are some of the core functions of Photoshop. And if you can master these sort of four or five functions, you can run a semester's worth of projects. And the last thing we're going to do is text. And so let's go ahead. Let's turn off the select subject artboards and turn on the text artboards. And here we are. And I'm going to open up this text artboard and we just have a background, which I will lock. Text in Photoshop is super important to know how to use, right? Graphic design is heavily text-based. 
But text in Photoshop is sort of a pain. It runs a little slowly. When you change the size, it can lag a little bit. So we're just going to do like the most basic text options. And we're just going to write out this Maya Angelou quote, right? We're in Winston-Salem for summer conference. So we'll do someone local. And we're going to make the text look like this. And I've given exactly what it should look like. And we just want to write it. So text in Photoshop is using the type tool right here. And if you right click, there's the horizontal type, vertical type, vertical type mask, horizontal type mask. We're not gonna worry about any of those except the regular horizontal type tool, which is the default tool. And there's two ways that you can do text. One is called area type. And that's where you hold left click and you draw a text box, right? That is your PowerPoint type. This is useful because it forces us into an area. But it's also tough in Photoshop, especially for students, because Photoshop always saves your previous text options. And let's say my font was size like 400. It doesn't even show up anymore because it's bigger than the whole text box. And if your last font was size 400 because you were working on a movie poster and now you're working on a business card, when you choose the type tool, it's going to be size 400 again. So... Area type is really good, but I think when I start out with my students, I tell them to just do what's called point type. And that's where you just click once, right? You can see what size 400 type looks like. And you could, of course, change that 400 before you create your text, but students often don't remember to change things. So we're going to grab the type tool. And with the type tool, we have some options up here. I've got my font. I've got the font style, I've got the size, and I've got some other options. I've got my paragraph options and the color right here. So I'm going to choose the font, the size, and the color first. So we're just using Courier New, right, which is just used to be the Microsoft Word font, I believe. Courier New. And you can search fonts in here. You can filter fonts by serif and sans serif and things like that. But we're going to stay basic for now. You can download fonts, right? I've got some Star Wars fonts in there and things like that. This does run slow, right? The fonts are a little laggy in Photoshop because there's so many fonts. And on some computers, like on in my school, students can download their own fonts. But you really want to be careful because the more fonts you install in Photoshop, the slower Photoshop and the font options tend to run. Um, and we're not going to make it bold. In fact, I'm going to choose regular and the size is not 400. It's 23. So I'm going to type in 23, just like that. And the color right here, I'm going to click on the color and crash course of color, right? We have our hex code here. Color is five, 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 five. So I'm just going to type in where it says hashtag five, 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 which is a shade of gray and hit okay. And so now I'm, I'm just going to do my point type. I'm going to click once. And you'll see that it gives us this lorem ipsum default font, right? Oh, I see why it's doing that. I don't want it centered. And lorem ipsum, I think, is a speech by Cicero, or it's the start of a speech by Cicero. It's just like the, it's Latin. It's the default autofill text in Photoshop. And it's just giving me like a preview of what my font is going to look like. When we start um, using the type tool, it highlights it. So I can just start typing over it. So I'm just going to type, right? And we want to make it line break like it has. So I'm going to hit enter. Sorry, my keyboard is loud. I just built a new keyboard. Right, you can see my fonts actually going off the edge of the page a little bit. We're gonna fix that later, comma. But people will never forget how you made them feel. And we're gonna do the Maya Angelou after. And when I'm done typing my font, right, I'm still in my type tool. So I either want to click on the little checkbox up here. I can go back to my move tool here or the keyboard shortcut is control enter, which like finalizes our font. And now I can go back to my move tool and I can move this around. Now this problem that I have here with it going off the page 
wouldn't happen if I used area type and I created a text box for myself, right? It would have fixed that problem, but I didn't and it's okay. Oh, this should not say PTV. Sorry, it should say point, 23 point font. So I want to change the tracking, the leading, and I'm going to add a drop shadow. Tracking is the horizontal space between all of the characters in one layer, right? So you can see that these are a little closer together than mine. Leading is line spacing. These lines are closer together than mine. And to adjust those, we just have to have our layer selected and we go over to our properties panel. Knowing these text options is super, super important for Photoshop, especially if you want your kids to certify. These show up on the certification tests pretty frequently between all of the programs and they're part of the objective domains for the certifications and also for our curriculum, which is why I'm going over this now. And we've got these options over here, which are the same as that were up there. So if I got my text on the page and realized I didn't like my font, I could always change the font, right? I could change it to the Star Wars font. It doesn't make a lot of sense for this. Um, I could do Arial, uh, Calibri, right? If I was making a meme, I could go down and choose the impact font. This is the meme font, if you didn't know that. Uh, Helvetica New is not here. That's my personal favorite font, even though it's really basic. But I've got some other options here, and that's what we want to mess with. We want to mess with the leading and the tracking. And again, you can hover over these and see the tool tips. Students often forget which one is which, so I just tell them to hover and find it. And I'm just going to type numbers in here. So for the leading, I want 25. So I'm going to type in 25 and hit enter. And let's see what happens down here. Oh, they got a little closer together, right? Not a ton, but enough. And now in my tracking, right now it's set to zero, which is default. I'm going to type in negative 25. And you see how all the letters got a little closer together. And they got close enough together so that this comma is on the page now, right? Pretty useful to know this. And knowing these text tools and these sort of typography terms and options is just so valuable in regards to graphic design, right? Um, I think it's always good to like pull up a textbook or like a really small book for your students and show them just like how hard it is to read when all the letters are too close together or when the lines like touch each other, right? When the lines touch each other, students tend to skip lines or they reread the same line over and over again. But when you have like properly spaced text, it makes the actual reading experience way more palatable and easier for kids, I think. And now maybe I'll do Maya Angelou, but I'm going to change the options. So I'll grab my type tool and I'm going to choose a different font for her name. I'll choose, I don't even remember the one I chose. Whoops. So you can see I have a problem right now, right? And that's that I still have this layer selected. And because I have this layer selected, it's actually changing the font um, of that layer. So I'm going to click off of that layer, right? Deselect it. Now I'll get my type tool and I'll choose a new font. Uh, maybe I'll choose adventure. And I'm just going to click once and I'm going to do like dash, right? Control enter. I'm going to go to my move tool. I'm going to move it around like this and it'll snap, right? Those are our smart guides allow us to snap things just like that. Maybe space that down. Now, because this is on a separate layer, the tracking and the leading are different than this layer, right? They're different. They're literally different numbers. So if I wanted to make these letters a little closer together, I could go in, I could type a number in here or negative 25, say negative 50, right? They're even closer together now. And I can't actually do leading if there's not multiple lines of text, right? We have to have multiple lines in the same layer to adjust the leading. All right, you did it, right? That's the crash course to Photoshop. Hopefully this wasn't too much in one day. And the video is here for you guys. You can feel free to watch this whenever you want. Shoot me an email. Uh, my email will be in the presentation that, that is given during summer conference. Uh, there's a lot that you can do in Photoshop. There's there almost an infinite amount of things that you can do. If you can think of something, there's a good chance that you can do it in Photoshop. And what we learned today are just some of the most core basic functions to get you on the path to creating whatever it is that you want in Photoshop. Thanks for your time.